in the afternoon and his family said he was sleeping and I talked to him, he didn't sound very good, so I knew that I'd better do something I wanted to do all these years was get all these stories from people who worked on this movie and put them together, plus my collection of pictures and home movies and stills and everything and, and uh, have it in a, preserve it in a documentary because I've been going to film festivals and holding things up, you know. Here's this and that, so I finally decided to put it all down in a, in a document, which is not really a documentary, but I call it a, a, a tribute to Orson. Uh, I hope you can all see uh, the movies that are showing. Uh, some of the really surprises are coming up this week, some of the r rare films that haven't been shown. And uh, I'm very happy to be in uh, Delhi, in India. It's been very nice. Any more questions? Or that's it, I guess. Gary. You have to hold still for focus. <laughs> You're making him laugh. <laughs> Don't move your head around. OK, uh, tell us how you met Orson Welles. Uh, I was aggressive about meeting Orson Welles because I admired Orson Welles so much. And I wanted, I was not happy with the films I was making as a director of photography, cameraman. And when I had the opportunity to meet him, I forced the, the, the scene, the issue that I would call him and meet with him. Because he was, the, I, I love his movies. And he wasn't making enough movies. And I thought I could bring him my knowledge of what I could do to help him make a movie without costing a lot of money. And uh, he liked me and accepted it, and we began to make a movie, which lasted over a period of four, four and a half years, on and off, called The Other Side of the Wind. And while we were making The Other Side of the Wind, we were in Europe, and we stopped, and we made another movie called uh, F for Fake. So we made two features within that time. How was it working with a man who achieved success at such an early age and who made uh, films which were so unusual, so, so different for the times that they were in? How was it? Uh, what kind of experiences do you feel you can think back or to? Well, you know, I was, of course, I was. Uh, like looking up to overwhelmed at first. I mean, I'm, he has so much ta more talent than anybody that I ever met or probably ever will meet. It just doesn't always exist, a person with this, this much talent and this capacity for film and theater and, and not afraid to experiment and try different things. We'll try it this way, we'll try it that way. and. Uh, will find the way, or maybe this is the only way. Because he was, a, he was a writer. People forget that he was also a great, great writer. He wrote all of his own scripts. And he, he uh, not only was a writer, was a director, and he was a magician. From theater and film and magic and, uh, and as an actor. He, he could have such a range to play almost anything, you know. He played, you know, mostly he played very important men, or, you know, a Borgia, or a Citizen Kane, or a, a king, or a, you know, a, you know, a pope or something. You know, he played all kinds of great roles, Moby Dick and everything. And, and but he played once a kind of a little sissy guy, you know, in a movie in in Africa. So he could do all kinds of stuff. And uh, and I was just, uh, you know. I was the kid sitting there listening to everything and taking it all in and, and having to keep up with him. And he said, I want to do this. Well, then I had to be able to do this. And he'd say, um, well, you've done this, haven't you? i say, well, no. He said, you haven't? Well, here's the way we do it. You know, We'd set up some mirrors and some pieces of glass, and we would do things. And, and he was always asking me for stuff. And if I no, didn't know how to do it, I had to learn or make it up or invented, put it together. But he was always experimenting, always writing, and always, always wanting to film, and always wanting to edit. 
what were the reactions uh, to his early films uh, from the audience because uh, there was uh, the films had such a such an unusual quality to them uh, films that were not made before that time how how uh, do you think the audience reacted what do you know of that well of course you know i didn't meet orson until 1970 so i only know from speaking with him which was this was i tell you this part was a little tough orson did not want to talk about his old movies he just he said i don't want to go down memory lane and i would try to get him to watch the movies on television he didn't want to i said why he says, because I want to go back and fix them. I can make them better. I can make Kane better. I can make Ambersons better. Lady from Shanghai, I can do, I, if I watch it, I want to re-edit and do more. But the reaction of Citizen Kane was uh, very mixed. Most people of intelligence loved the movie. And most people who saw it loved the movie. But because of the political climate and that he did it about a newspaper man who was living, that the newspaper man would not, Hearst, William Randolph Hearst, would not advertise the movie so that you didn't get any publicity. It played in only a certain number of theaters in the big cities. So the reaction was good, and then there was no reaction because not enough people saw it. What, what according to you, after having spoken with him, were the inspirations that made him uh, do the kind of films he did? What drove him to that kind of creativity? He, he saw everything as big, in a, in a grand style. He loved actors, good actors. He really loved good actors. And he dismissed the other ones that weren't really actors at all. He. Um, it wasn't that he had such a grand, he wasn't like a pompous guy. He wasn't, oh, I'm Orson Welles and stuff like that. He was just a you know, guy you know, like you and I. He would laugh at things and, and he'd find strange things so interesting. And he was uh, interested, he was reading books all the time on the technology. He was knowing more than, he was knowing more than I did. I, he'd say, you see this new camera they got out? I'd say, no, not yet. Well, we got to get one. We got to work with it. We got to try it out. And he was uh, he was uh, he was wonderful with the actors. He could get almost any actor to work with him. They just loved it because they would play around with the scene and try it. And he'd say, "Well, maybe I don't like to say this dialogue, Orson. Well, let somebody else say it or something." You know, he was inventing and experimenting all the time. I, every time I mention to an actor, though they, of course I'll work with Orson. And uh, his inspirations, I think, really came from within. And I think that he could not help being the way he was. He couldn't just make a regular Hollywood movie. There had to be something, you know, um, some good, it had to be a good story. And he loved Shakespeare, of course. But I thought he should have, try to make more American kind of stories, but anyway, that's why when I met with him, we, we got on to that story of an old movie director. And he had a very, he was, he was inspired by strange things and characters and human behavior, and he would pick up on this stuff and use it, a strength or a weakness an actor would have. And he'd use that and incorporate that within, within the character. And he was very firm about story structure and how it should go, the you know, beginning, middle, and then in three acts, etc. And within that structure, he would experiment, as you can see in Citizen Kane, find different ways to do scenes. We would sometimes uh, build a set and light it and do all the lighting and everything. And we, because we were doing, uh, uh, we we're not spending a lot of money on you know, keeping the cost down. We would look at the set and we'd look and Orson would say, he said, no, no, he said, anybody can do that. Take it away. Let's start with something else. That was Orson. I'm talking about Tammy Ripley. That was Orson. Well, that was Orson. It was like that. Um, 
he considering he used to experiment so much in his films and use so many um special effects in in his visuals and his sounds mm, how uh, how much uh, time would uh, um, orson well spend in working um, before he actually goes on to the schedule uh, of shooting the film how much time would he spend working out each shot and how would he go about the visualization process it would depend upon the situation and the circumstances uh, if we, if it was a small group of us we would we would spend a lot of time um, fixing things fixing the lights adding something to the set you know waiting for the light and everything that that would be we would had the luxury of taking time with that when we had 15 or 20 actors sitting around you know in the hotels and uh, everyone that had to work then we were the work was speed the work fast we would sit down and rehearse with the actors until it was ready and then we'd shoot and we'd shoot quick over and over again that he would have every shot worked out on paper before he got on to it or did no, he uh, it was all up here as i said sometimes it was on paper and sometimes it wasn't it depended on if we had to do a big scene sometimes he would come with a with a, a diagram saying where he wanted the lights and what what was the chair was supposed to be here or something there and a lot of times we would we would be filming in big houses that we rented so he didn't sleep at night he had insomnia kind of a way so while i was sleeping he would be going through the house figuring out where things were going to go and where the actors would be and everything so he was prepared that way um you were telling us about a um, um film that you completed uh, which was uh, unfinished for 50 years it's all true it's all true um tell us the story behind it how uh, what happened Wh why was it deserted and uh, how did you get the back studio uh, RKO Studios that had made Citizen Kane it gave him this contract and Magnificent Ambersons uh were under pressure from people that the pictures didn't get shown enough and make enough money that they were good and they were they were ha proud of them but they were not money makers so it was a coincidence that at the time that Orson Welles was sent by the government Nelson Rockefeller who was part owner in the studio to go and make a picture uh a goodwill movie between the United States and South America that Orson go to Brazil and make a film which he did while he was in Brazil the studio changed ownership and the people who were supportive of Orson Welles left and new people came in and they looked and they said we're not making any money with Orson Welles and he's down in Brazil that's it he's finished So Orson was in Brazil. They took his cameras away. They left him one little camera and some film, and he finished this movie. He did not want to leave Brazil, leaving the movie unfinished. And when he came back from Brazil with the movie that he'd made, part of a movie, there were three parts. So the movie that he finished is about 45 minutes long. When he came back, he found that they they had moved his office out. They had moved his actors, the Mercury Theater actors was gone. and he was out and he tried to buy this movie from RKO and they wouldn't sell it to him he tried many times to buy this and finish it and they wouldn't do it so he gave up 40 some years later the film was found and some friends who brought it to me and Orson they wanted to finish it and at that time Orson didn't care to finish it he wanted to go on and make other pictures he didn't see anything to finish something made so long ago that no one would be interested but uh four years ago there was some interest and I, i went to brazil and photographed uh interviews with all the people who had worked on the movie 45 years ago 40 years ago which was quite interesting so the movie was released by paramount pictures called it's all true and it's about half an hour of stuff that i did uh in brazil and about 40 minutes of orson's movie to two sections 
Uh, tell us something about uh, your film uh, called Working with Orson Welles. I decided because people were saying well that Orson didn't uh, wasn't doing anything in the last 15 years of his life and I knew that he had and so I wanted to make a documentary not, which I don't call a documentary it's more of a, tr a tribute which is shall I show the picture please da da there it is working with Orson Welles this is a um, um, an hour and a half story of uh, how we made films, uh, Orson and I, and with other people, and their stories, and pictures, and stills, and a lot of we tests, shows of tests we did, and things, to prepare to make this picture. And uh, I had all of these things sitting in boxes, films, and stills, and everything, and I said I should put it in a, in a, in a program form. So I did it. Are you satisfied with the end result? I'm glad I did it, yes. Very happy. You there might be part two. <laughs> There's more material. Yeah. I couldn't interview everybody. It's too long. But uh, the people who were around me in Hollywood at the time, and uh, I wanted to get their stories before they forgot them and went away. Um, you, were, you were telling us something about Othello and how you helped to revive it and things. Did you work on well, I've been, a, I've been a film preserver and, and saving things, and I, yes, I, I saved and protected the, the, uh, what we, um, the uh, copy negative on Othello. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, did, they did another version of Othello. They put new sound and new picture on it and released it, but I had, I had saved the original one, and that's, that's come out in America. And, uh, video and laser disc because if you don't save these things they just get thrown away or discarded or people don't remember where they are uh, Guy, are there any people now in in film business in Hollywood or other places who are able to emulate the kind of work Orson Welles did in his time is there anybody now who's doing the kind no. of work he did why do you think that is there, I don't know, there was just no one, there was no one like Orson. Mainly because of his personality and that he was an actor as well as a, if he was just a director and not an actor, it would be a different career. But you see, he was an actor and he was in every movie in different makeup. And it was her, his personality as well as his direction, I think, that put over those movies. It was compelling to watch him. And you could see, and I asked him once why he was in every movie. He said, well, it was uh, cheap. I didn't have to hire another actor, which was right. You know, he was a, a smart thing that when he made Citizen Kane, he set himself up as, as, as a movie star. So that at least he had, he had an actor career, a director career, uh, well, actor, director career mostly, that, that, if, that if he wasn't working as a director, he could work as an, as an actor. And he was enough of a famous actor that he could put himself in his movies and they would able you know people would want to see them he had this aristocratic regal uh, look about him and he always act, had took the roles or rather i don't know whether he chose the roles where he had that character to portray do you think he could have done the character of a poor man on the streets or a man who didn't have money, who... Oh, sure. He did one film. I didn't do it. But it was, uh, it was called, in London called One Man Band, where he played a guy with playing all the instruments, you know, and a woman looks out the window and says, shh, and that's Orson, is a woman. Then the policeman comes by with a mustache, and that's Orson. <laughs> then there's a beggar, and there's a... He plays about eight characters, all within one movie. Yeah, he could do anything like that. There are some directors I admire. I admire Clint Eastwood. Orson liked Clint Eastwood a lot. He never worked. But it's a different with type. That's a different type thing, you know. But he never worked with Clint Eastwood. He never. He never. Took no, him but in. he liked him. He thought he was a very good director. But was he averse to to taking uh, different actors, uh, famous actors, in his films? Who? Uh, Orson Welles. Did he? 
Was was he averse to it? Was he he didn't all, want no. to do? No, no, no. He always had. He always had good actors with him. You know, Jean Moreau worked with him a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, Joseph Cotton people he he brought together and everything. And uh, the actors wanted to work with Orson. They liked it. John Huston was the the last movie we made. Orson was not in it though. He does not appear in the movie. John Huston plays a director, but not a director like Orson or Huston. Is it time to go? Yeah, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is waiting around. Oh, okay. Briefly, what would you like to say as a tribute to your friend Orson Welles? As a tribute? Oh, that's tough. I never thought about that. I mean, well, bef before I met him and after he's gone, it's the same thing. I, I just admired him so much. And I mean, I got to work with him. and I. And I, I miss that. And he was an, he was an inspiration to me. To to never give up, to always go on, and always do things. If people say, "Well, you can't do that," it's not true. You can. And uh, you want to make a movie, or you want to do something, or put it, play, do it. You can do it. You just you'll find a way to do it. And uh, I loved him, and I miss him, and I wish I could talk to him, but I I can't anymore. Because I do really miss him because uh, there's so many people I work with a lot of times that they'll probably listen. I hope they don't listen to this. They're, it's boring, you know. Orson wasn't boring. It was fun and the, the work was creative. And it's fun to watch. And most stuff is not. Most of the movies I do, I don't even, I don't even watch them afterwards. I mean, I make for other directors. 